passion to invest in the lives of other people takes hard work, but the rewards in the end are priceless. Thank you, my dear. Yes. I feel like we need to have another time of prayer, because I feel like, I don't know if this is spiritual warfare or it's just me turning 61 years old a few weeks ago. I think that's probably the issue. And again, don't change the channel, folks. Stay with us. We'll get it together. So, but here's the main idea. A passion to invest in the lives of other people takes hard work. says again that as he as, as, when the uproar ceased Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them he said farewell and departed from Macedonia these disciples are the friends there in Ephesus that he has been meeting with every day training them in the word of God you remember last week in chapter 19 verses 8 and 9 Paul is reasoning synagogue with them for a period of three months, teaching about the kingdom of God. But then some Jews get angry and kick him out of the synagogue. So it says that he withdrew in verse 9, uh, verse nine of chapter 19. He withdrew and took the disciples with him, and they began meeting daily in the hall of Tyrannus, who apparently rented space for Paul and 
his disciples to do this daily ministry. It says that these guys met daily for two years with Paul. You can imagine, if you've ever been in a group like this, you can imagine how close these guys got every day for two years. Learning God's word together, caring for each other, praying together. And now, after two years, Paul says, it's time for me to move on. But before doing that, he calls them together and encourages them. It's that word we talked about a few weeks ago, parakaleo, or the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one who comes beside to encourage. He calls these guys together and encourages them to keep following Jesus, even after he goes on. He says, in effect, okay guys, I've got confidence in you now, you can go on without me. That's what disciples do. They learn for a while and then they leave. And he says, now it's your turn to disciple someone else. Bring them into the group. You lead. I'm moving on. And then it says he leaves for Macedonia. If you look at the map on the screen, and if you're watching on TV at home or on Facebook or YouTube, you might want to turn in the back of your Bible to the map section and look at Paul's third missionary journey, because that's where we are. And we're going to be showing him traveling around in this section today. He leaves for Macedonia. Now, Macedonia is northwest of Ephesus. Here's Paul's location here in Ephesus, and he's going to go up here to Macedonia, to Philippi, to Thessalonica, and Berea. You might remember way back before the coronavirus hit, and we had to take a break we learned that Paul went into these cities in Macedonia and won people to Jesus and started churches in these areas. Notice what it says in verse 2 here of Acts 20. When he had gone through those regions in Macedonia and had given them encouragement, there's that word again. Some of your versions say exhortation. It's a similar word. It's the same word in Greek to come alongside to either encourage or to challenge. But he is going there to give them encouragement in their discipleship or in their following Jesus. They'd come to Jesus already when he was there before. But he goes back, as he always do, does through the book of Acts, to go back and strengthen the churches, it says, over and over again through the book of Acts. And that's what he's doing here. He's continuing discipleship. He's investing in them. And then it says, when he had given them much encouragement, verse 2, it says he came to Greece. Now back to the map. Right down here is uh, on the map, it's called Achaia. And right in there is Corinth and Athens. And this is modern day Greece. And so he's moving from the north of modern-day Greece down to the south. And that's where Corinth is. But before he goes south, notice what he does. He gives this encouragement. He takes Jesus seriously when Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations. Did you ever stop and think, why didn't Jesus say, go and make converts of all the nations? said disciples, because disciples are a step further than converts. You've got to come up, become a convert first, so it's assumed that you win somebody, but then you teach them, and Jesus says, teach them all things that I have taught you, baptize them, and then teach them. It's conversion and discipleship all through the New Testament, and Paul is committed to that. He invests his life in this all the time. It's what makes him tick. He has a passion for investing in people through discipleship. Now let me let you in on a little secret here. When you invest your life in people, winning them to Jesus, and then especially helping them grow,
takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of commitment to keep meeting with someone, to skip holidays and then come back together and meet again, or to go through times like the COVID-19 and then decide we got to get back together again because we've lost touch. It's hard work to do that. It takes an investment in lives. But you will be rewarded greatly for that. And I am not just talking about rewards in heaven. I am talking about rewards now. You will most likely be rewarded with deep personal friendships that carry you through life. Look at verse 4. As Andy read verse 4, you may have drifted off to sleep. Hopefully not, because it's quick. But it's one of those name and place verses that you might be tempted to skim over. But don't. This is where the rewards are. Sopater, the Berean. He's a guy we all know well, don't we? The son of Pyrrhus, you know him. He accompanied Paul. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus. And Gaius of Derby, don't forget him. And Timothy, well we know Timothy. And the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on and waited for us at Troas. Do you know who these guys, these seven guys are? They are seven of Paul's disciples. Seven disciples that he has made all through the book of Acts as we have shown him traveling back and forth across Asia, all through these cities here. He has won a few here, won a few there, and discipled and invested in these guys that are mainly unknown to us but deep, rich relationships have those, they have deep relationships with Paul, and they are traveling with him now. They're his best buddies. Sopater is from Berea, right up here in Macedonia, where we pointed to a moment ago. Aristarchus and Secundus are from Thessalonica, down the road from Berea. Same area. Philippi is there. Aristarchus is one of the guys that got dragged into the riot last week in chapter 19. Why did he get dragged into the riot? Probably because he was laying his life down for his buddy Paul. Because he would rather go in there and get torn limb from limb than let Paul, let that happen to Paul. That is Aristarchus and Secundus. They're both from Thessalonica. There's another guy here, Gaius of Derby, who's the other guy that got dragged into the riot. And then it says Timothy. We know about Timothy, but guess where Timothy came from? Timothy came, if you remember, from a little town called Lystra where Paul got stoned and left for dead. And, stone, and after that happened, Paul went back to strengthen the disciples, to disciple them, to invest in them. It's hard work, especially to go back and invest in people who stoned you. But Paul goes, and guess what? He meets a 16-year-old boy named Timothy. That is the way the gospel works. He probably looked at this kid and said, you little wimp, you got so much to learn, but come on with me. Because he saw some potential and hunger for God. And Timothy becomes his son in the faith. My dear son in the faith, he tells him. These guys are disciples. It's Paul's investment. And it comes back to reward him as he's going on this journey as things are getting more and more tense and these guys are his magnificent seven you remember that movie they remade a few years ago in the old western and now it's got denzel washington and uh, ethan hawk and some other guys 
the Magnificent Seven, that's who these guys are. They're surrounding Paul, their father in the faith, who's invested in them. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this principle play out that we're describing here. Becky and I had the privilege, as most of you know, of being youth ministers for many years in Texas. And I used to meet with teenage guys like Timothy. Most of them weren't quite at Timothy's level of spiritual maturity at 16. Some of them we were trying to wake them up so they could go to school in a little while, but they'd come, stumble in for a little breakfast. Becky met with girls. Those people are some of our dearest friends now. They're raising kids, and a whole lot of them are raising them for Jesus. Brett and Christy get to see this with Young Life. Brett did a, fu a, a, he did a funeral a few, weeks, uh, a few months ago for somebody that was close to them, but he also had the privilege, he and Christy, of being at a wedding, and Brett did the wedding of a daughter in the faith to them. That's what Paul is seeing here. It's hard work to invest in people in discipleship, but it's so worth it in the end. It's priceless. I want to encourage you. We can't get together like we used to, uh, but we have a men's group that we've started meeting in the, in the back here in the fellowship hall on Tuesday mornings. We have a ladies' group that is going to try to get together when it's possible. But we spread out in the fellowship hall and go get our breakfast and bring it here now at 8 o'clock. And let me just tell you something. These guys are all old men, a lot older than me. But they are my dearest brothers in the Lord because of those times together. We lost Brian Smith not too long ago. And when we look around that table, we know we're not going to be able to meet forever. But the investment of time with one another, and I want to encourage you, whatever area you're in in life and in this difficulty, we all need a Paul in our life that invests in us, and then we need a Timothy in our life that we pour into. And it's not rocket science. A lot of it is just encouragement like Paul does here getting with somebody and saying, hey, let's, let's get together once a, while, uh, once a week and have some coffee. And let's just maybe read a book together or read a book in the Bible and discuss it each week. And let's just pray together. The investment that Paul is so passionate about is hard work. It's inconvenient for our schedule, but it will bring deep, lifelong rewards and eternity-long rewards for us. That is one of the things that makes Paul tick, his passion for investing in people through discipleship. Well, let's look at the second area. Paul invests in people not only by discipling them, but by getting his hands dirty. And it, we are called to get our hands dirty in people's needy lives. Now, when you open to Acts 20, verses 1 to 6, it's hard to see this, because it doesn't appear in the text. Luke doesn't refer to it. But we learn about it in letters that Paul has written to other churches. We learn that there has been a famine in Jerusalem. And as, as Andy read in Romans 15, Paul is writing the Romans, telling them, I am raising a collection for the saints in Jerusalem who are starving to death. You know, Paul was the apostle who was doing all kinds of evangelism, all kinds of discipleship. He is He's also making tents, by the way, in his own time. He is pretty busy. But when this need comes up, you would think that he would find someone else to pass this on to. But no, he leads the charge in getting his hands dirty with 
physical needs that people have. He writes to the Roman church about it, like Andy read. He also writes to the Corinthian church about it and ch ch challenges them. He has worked with the, Medi uh, the Macedonian churches like Berea, Thessalonica, and Philippi, and all these churches start investing money in this project. Why? Because Paul has a passion for investing in people not only in discipleship, but in getting his hands dirty in their physical needs. What Paul is doing here could be considered social work instead of gospel work. He is meeting the physical needs of people in Jerusalem, but he doesn't care. He's ministering to people. It needs to be done, and he is passionate about it. He has gone to great lengths to organize it well, to have good accountability with other people helping carry the money to Jerusalem. He's very careful about how he does this. And he gives us great principles for how to take care of the Lord's money. But here's the deal about social needs. Social needs have always been a hot button in the church. Many times in history, the church has gone to one extreme or the other. Nearly a century ago, our country went through the Great Depression. The stock market crashed. Uh, you were trying to rebound from World War I. It was a horrible time to live through. People stood in long food lines in the cold. And churches were often on the front lines and serving the needs of hungry and poor people. But a huge controversy erupted over what was more important, ministering to the physical needs, food, shelter, and clothing, or ministering to the spiritual needs, salvation and discipleship. And by default, a great divide took place. The liberal churches started feeding the poor, taught, worried about clothing and shelter, and the conservative churches preached the gospel. We still have this divide today. There's a huge debate going on right now among some of my favorite pastors and theologians about this very principle. Some say, just preach the gospel, don't get distracted. We're not called to do social work. Others say, but the gospel has social implications. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We can't ignore these needs. But Paul teaches us right here that it doesn't have to be either or. It has to be both and. The gospel is both vertical and the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And horizontal, the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. General William Booth started the Salvation Army in 1865 with that principle. They served food, gave shelter, clothing, and preached the gospel loudly and clearly. Their motto was heart to God, hand to man. D.L. Moody, in the same way, was the greatest evangelist of the 19th century. He was the Billy Graham of the 19th century. But he started a group called Young Man's Christian Association, the YMCA. Now, organizations slip away from their founding principles very easily. But the idea that D.L. Moody had and General William Booth had for the Salvation Army was based on Paul's approach here. Preach the gospel and get your hands dirty. Both and. It affects meeting needs, especially a time like we are in right now with COVID-19, with so many people being out of work. We are called to be on the front lines. It's one of our best ways as believers to present the gospel. When you help us serve at Way of the Cross, you're preaching the gospel. 
You may not be saying a whole lot, but you are showing the love of Jesus. And the greatest way to do that is to follow up, like Jesus did with the woman at the well, with a conversation that moves from water in the well to living water. Both and, not either or. Obviously, this week has brought other issues to the surface. With the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, tensions are high. People are hurt. They're angry. They're confused. Many of us are totally confused about how to respond. What should Christians do? It may just start with a smile and looking someone in the eye of the another race and greeting them. The other night, I went to the gym to get some exercise. It was the night after George Floyd's death. There were two African-American men, young men, working out on a machine near me. One was sitting down on the machine and the other was standing nearby. They were talking, they had their headphones on. They both were built like tanks And I looked over at them, and I suddenly felt like I needed to say something to them. Now, one of the rules about being in a gym, especially when somebody has their headphones on, is don't go up and small talk with them. They're not there to talk, usually. They just want to get their stuff done and get out of there. And I don't know how to say this, but I don't normally receive audible voices from God, and I didn't the other night. But I did hear a still small voice that said, you need to go talk to those guys. And I looked over and saw how well built they were, and they seemed to be just doing fine, so I just ignored that voice. And I thought, I gotta get out of here, I gotta get home. And the little voice said again, what are you so afraid of? Something like that. I didn't hear it audibly. But I was struggling with it. I felt like the Lord was saying, reach out. So I walked over to him, and I asked if I could talk to him a second. They both looked at me a little cautiously, to be honest. I introduced myself, and I said, guys, excuse me. My name is Tim. And I... I don't know how to say this. I just feel terrible about what's happened in Minneapolis. And for whatever it's worth, I just want you to know I'm really sorry about what's happened. Then I went on and said, by the way, I'm a pastor. And I feel like I need to say something about this for our folks on Sunday. I'm wondering what you would think that our church of mainly white people need to hear. And then I steeled myself and got ready because I didn't know what they were going to say to that. The young man sitting down looked at me and he said, well, I think you need to give them the word. And he said, the Bible says, if a man says he loves God but hates his brother, He is a liar, and the love of the Father is not in him. That's in 1 John. I hoped he didn't notice the shock on my face with his answer, but then he continued. It also says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, nor male nor female, nor slave nor free, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. He said, just give them the word, brother. A lot of people think this is a physical fight. This is spiritual, he said. He said, we we can't fight spiritual warfare with physical weapons. It takes prayer. It takes the word. And then he looked at me like, don't you know that, (laughs) pastor? Now, I'm not telling you that story to make it sound like I accomplished anything there, or to pat myself on the back. 
I'm saying I felt the Lord pushing me to say, to, to reach out and just bridge a conversation. And it helped me probably more than it helped them. And I have two new friends now that I told them afterwards, I'll look forward to seeing you next time. My point is this, the gospel is about salvation, but it also gets its hands dirty. We can't just stay in our little sanctuary and ignore the dirty deeds and dirty needs of this world that we're in. We're to be salt and light. We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves, and that is New Testament, not just Old Testament. Paul lays it out for us, and Jesus laid it out before him. He told the Good Samaritan story for this reason. It's not either or, it's both and. So Paul shows his passion for ministering to people by discipling them, by getting his hands dirty. But there's one more thing that, again, doesn't show up as much in Acts 20 as it does in, every, uh, in other stories, in other epistles of Paul to show us why he felt the need to lead, leave Ephesus. But here's the third reason he left. He left to make disciples, he left to get his hands dirty with raising the funds for the Jerusalem church and all, the, all these churches. But thirdly, he leaves because he is going to invest in people by working to heal broken relationships. Paul is passionate about people, and he loves people. But the third reason he leaves Ephesus is to go to Corinth because relationships are broken. And Paul shows us something to be passionate about here that is really hard. It's hard to invest your life in these kinds of relationships because many times it breaks down. Even among believers, and Paul is passionate about his love for the Corinthians who are stubborn and foolish and immature. But he loves them so much that he is going to invest in trying to heal a broken relationship. Again, we don't read it here, but it, we read it in the book of 2 Corinthians. There's a problem in their relationship. He's had to rebuke them about sin in their church. And they have gotten upset about it, like people tend to do when you confront them. They also have some fancy Greek orator speakers who are apparently better than Paul. And they like them a lot more. But the problem is, these guys are leading them astray with false teaching. So Paul is in an awkward situation. He's not saying, you like them more than me. He's saying, I want you to know the truth. He loves these people, but the relationship is on the rocks. It's bad. And unfortunately, that's not uncommon. Paul doesn't have Facebook, and he doesn't have a Zoom conference to sit down and talk with these folks and he is not sure how they've responded to this letter that he wrote to rebuke them. And so he sends his young ministry partner, Titus, we learn in 2 Corinthians 2. He sends Titus, who is another one of his disciples, over to Corinth. In chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, he says, I sent him to find out how they responded. And the plan was for them to meet in Troas. Back to the map here. Troas is just up from Ephesus, right up here on the western coast. And it is a short sail from there over to Macedonia and down to Corinth. He has sent Titus ahead 
to get to test the waters, and then they are going to meet in Troas, and Titus is going to let him know how they responded. This is where you see the intensity of Paul's passion. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12, listen to this, what he says. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord. Now notice that phrase. We're talking about the Apostle Paul, who is like Billy Graham, takes any opportunity to preach the gospel. But when I came to Troas to preach the gospel, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. Did you hear that? This is the Apostle Paul saying, I passed up an opportunity for an evangelistic rally because my heart is all full of anxiety over the Corinthians and Titus didn't meet me. I just couldn't stay. I went on over to Macedonia. A few chapters later in chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, he says, in Macedonia, Titus showed up. He had been held up some, for some reason. We don't know if he met him in Philippi or Thessalonica or Berea, but they finally reunited. And he gives Paul the good news that the Corinthians had repented. They were truly grieving over their sins and they want to see Paul again. Paul is elated at the news and he sits down and writes them the book that is now called 2 Corinthians. What we see here is another lesson in personal relationships. Paul's passion for ministering to people doesn't stop when this breakdown, breakdown occurs in the friendship. He is passionate enough to follow through with the words of Jesus in Matthew 18, where he says, if your brother or sister has offense against you, go to them, which is an interesting passage. Jesus doesn't say, if your brother or sister has offense from you, sit by the phone and wait for them to call. It's on them. They're the ones that are mad. No, Jesus always turns things upside down. You go to them. You take the action. You're probably the one that's more mature if you're following me. Go do the awkward work. Paul is passionate about people. So much so that he loves discipleship as well as evangelism. He's going to do discipleship all over Macedonia and now Corinth. He is passionate about people to get his hands dirty. And he's passionate enough about people to do his part to heal a broken relationship. This is a part, as we close, this is a part of Christianity that a whole lot of us just do not want to tiptoe into. When a relationship gets broken, we just cut it off. And Paul follows Jesus in saying, I am not going to let that happen with my Corinthian friends. I'm their spiritual father, he says. I'll tell you a quick story that you've probably heard before, I think I've told this before, but it's a reminder to me of this. In youth ministry, many times there are misunderstandings, sometimes with kids, sometimes with parents, sometimes with both. And I had a situation one time where one of the young men in our group did something that was uh, pretty dangerous and had to be reported to his parents. And so I did that. And I remember hanging up the phone thinking, okay, we took care of that. But the parents 
didn't get mad at the sun, they got mad at me. And a few days later, I got a call from our pastor saying, we need to have a meeting tonight with you and brother so-and-so. And I said, okay, I'll be there. And I walked into a really awkward meeting. And it went on for a few hours, and it was emotional, and it was awkward all the way through. But our pastor was there as a mediator and shared a lot of wisdom, and that meeting ended with both of us, me and this brother in Christ that I'd known for many years, hugging each other and weeping on each other's shoulders. And he said to me, Tim, I came here tonight with the intention of getting you fired and I am so sorry and I said brother that's okay I love you and I'm glad we got it worked out about a year later I got a phone call and somebody said you're not going to believe this but this brother was out running and either had a heart attack or a heat stroke and he died. This guy was in his early 40s, maybe mid 40s. And I went to his funeral. I went to the viewing before the funeral. And I walked up to the casket and all of a sudden I just began to weep profusely. And I started talking to the corpse. I'd never done that before, but I started talking and I said, I am so glad we got that settled. It's important to be passionate enough about relationships to disciple, to get your hands dirty, but also to do your part to heal broken relationship. And that's what Paul models for us here. This is what makes him tick. This is what makes him so wonderful passion to invest in the lives of other people takes hard work but the rewards in the end are priceless do you remember the commercial just a year or two ago from mastercard baseball glove 75 dollars baseball 35 dollars play and catch in the backyard priceless this passion of Paul's, this that makes him tick, is hard work, but it's priceless in the end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Paul's heart. He's not perfect, but he loves you and loves, loved people. Thank you for the model he gave us. May we be people that are passionate about investing in one another's lives and getting our hands dirty and in loving one another deeply enough to fix it when it breaks. Help us to be like Christ. Help us to be like Paul, we pray. Teach us to follow you well. And we ask these things in your name.